I was just a little early tonight, and I heard that Brother Sullivan had uh, taken up a, a love offering for me. Now, I sure do appreciate that with all my heart, friends. If you had not have done it, it would have been just the same. It doesn't matter. Uh, I've been in the ministry of about 31 years, and I've never took an offering for myself yet or for anybody else. I never took one, and people have given me offerings. And what that offering goes for, it goes right into the tabernacle foundation. And from there, it's spent for overseas trips and for the kingdom of God's sake. I'm on a salary. I get $100 a week. That's what I get. And I don't have any... I thought someone out there, brother, would, might, I was trying to hold it up so they record it. That's more advantage the doctor's got in his office, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you, brother. Because it won't short anybody out there by this year. <laughs> So, uh, therefore, with the best of my ability, with all that I know how, I'll see that every penny of it goes to the kingdom of God, with all that I know how, because it's a portion of your living. I know there's no millionaires among us, and you need every penny that you can get. That thing's got a weak head. <laughs> and I tell you, I'll just lay my Bible against it. How's that? All right. That'll do for a little while, perhaps. <laughs> I'll fix it for you, brother. We got something here. That's it. How's that? A little bracer. Sometimes we all need that. Kind of get braced up, you know. Shot in the arm, we call it. <laughs> and uh, so um, I do appreciate it. And we'll do everything that I can to see that it goes for the kingdom of God. Now, oh, my, here's some more bandage. Now, yes, brother. Sir, we really go to fix this guy right up, aren't we? Sir, he's an important fellow here. He must be one of the boys. He must be. He surely must be. Oh, I was cutting somebody short, sure enough. I put the book over a microphone or two here. <laughs> you heard of Robin one to pay the other. <laughs> Thank you very kindly, brother. I'm sure ever who's that's running to you down there will appreciate that. <laughs> Today has been a great day for me. We've had much, and I've got a few announcements here that I want to make. <clears throat> the first thing is that you're all invited in the morning to the Christian Businessman's Fellowship Breakfast. We always have a great time at that meeting. That will be held at the Manchester Hotel, I think the ballroom, or and the tickets is on sale. You can see Brother Carlson or my field secretary, Brother Mercer, or Brother Gold. Right here, they have the tickets for the breakfast. And if you miss seeing them, come on down. There'll be somebody there to give you a ticket Brother in the morning. Rockwell what say? Brother Rockwell has them also. Has anyone else? That's, that's it. But if you miss it, there'll be somebody there in the morning at the, in the lobby to let you get a ticket. And the Lord willing, uh, uh, be speaking in the morning for this fellowship. I like the Christian Businessman's Fellowship because it stands for what I believe, uh, interdenominational fellowship. And they do a lot of sponsoring of my meetings around the world because in that I get the, uh, all the churches to, to sponsor because their, their fellowship they're, they're man. They're, it's out of their churches. The businessman, it's in their churches. Come into this organization. And then sometimes you have to receive me whether they like me or not. They just have to take me anyhow. Because their, their brethren is in there. But most always, I thank the Lord that even in ministers and in churches who see different, some people who doesn't even believe in, in the Pentecostal experience will come right in and help sponsor the meeting anyhow. I've, had, I've been sponsored by Baptists, Methodists, Lutheran, Presbyterians, all different kinds. Down in Mexico, I think it was the entire Baptist sponsorship down in Mexico City. And then a lot of the, lot of the places is the Lutheran. In Sweden right now, I think it is, or Norway, the Lutheran Church is to sponsor a complete oh, 
complete nationwide campaign. Down in Puerto Rico, one of the Billy Graham's group that sponsored him, the one that was his interpreter, came to the meeting, and the Lord did a great thing just there two nights, and now they've got the entire association of ministerials all over the island ready for a full island meeting. When I was leaving that morning, there was the fellow that was ahead of that big airport out there run up and threw his arms around me, started weeping a little, sort of a man in statue. He said, Brother Bram, when you were here about a year ago for a night or two, said I was sitting way back in the audience, and you called my name and told me I'd had migraine headaches for many years, and said, Thus saith the Lord, tonight they're over. said, I've never had one since. And said, and he was the head of that airport, some great official out there. I wouldn't say the head of it is one of the main men out there. In the interviews this morning, the Lord gave many visions. And I had certainly had a group this morning. On mornings, we use in the interviews to catch the cases that cannot, uh, just emergencies and things like that, where they've got to have uh, a, something from the Lord, a word of the Lord. And so then... The Lord has been awfully good to us in those things. And one man was telling me, I don't remember the case and wouldn't know it unless I get it back on the tape. Somebody from down in the south, I believe Alabama somewhere, the accuracy of the Holy Spirit telling the lady who she was, what her name was, what she'd done, how she'd got hurt as a little girl, told her the city she is from and all about it. And when it went to regard her name, it called her miss and she was a middle-aged woman but she's never been married just the accuracy of the holy spirit uh, it does that then this morning in the interviews they i suppose they're here it's a couple missionaries that were somewhere in a meeting i didn't get their name down here but they were in the interview this morning and said about some time ago they were in one of the meetings and the lady was suffering tremendously with something and and her husband also and said it told her who she was and what she's suffering with told her husband what was wrong with him and all about the things that they had done in life and where their calling was and is going to minister to people that wore little caps on their head which was jewish and is going overseas and everything would take place and she said everything just exactly the way it was was right and said then Coming back, she had taken sick, and she said that she, the doctors wanted to operate on her for some kind of a attack in the gall or something, and they wanted to operate immediately, but she come back to this side, if I get the story right, and said she prayed, Oh, Lord, I'm going over. She would get one of the magazines where it was to be at, and she said, Lord, last time I was up there, I got card number three. Please, Lord, let me have card number three again. I said, and uh, said the Holy Spirit seemed to tell her she's a Christian, I think formerly a, a Lutheran and a nurse out of a hospital. And said, the Lord told her, you'll have card number three. So that night when my son came to give out the card, so it'll be double when we're calling them meetings that no one will know. Billy has to get up before the crowd and take the cards and mix them all up together so that the people will know. Then another thing, no one knows where we're going to start the prayer line. I come and wherever the Holy Spirit leads me, I start from there. So he said he got up, mixed up all the cards and came down. She said, I want one. He handed it to her and passed on by. She looked at it. It was, it was 98, I believe, or 97, I believe. Yeah, 97, I think it was. And she said, oh, Lord, you promised me number three. And now you give me 97 or something. 97, 98, 97, I think it was. He said, you give me 97. And said, now you promised me number three. And said she began weeping and she didn't know what to do. Said, I'll never be called on 97. For the time she was in, I might have started from one. Said that night, coming to the platform, said I looked out over the audience real stern and said, I'm going to start tonight from 100 and come backwards. <laughs> Number three. <laughs> Is that lady in the building? Uh, uh, what, Lake? Wayne? Is the Oh, here she is, right in front of me. Oh, Lord bless you, sister. The Holy Spirit's always right, isn't he? <laughs> that's right. Lord bless you. Well, that's fine. You see, when the Holy Spirit promises anything, if it's the Holy Spirit, you'll get it. Just as he said. No matter what takes place, you'll get it. Now, to this convention, 
Brother Sullivan, Brother Bose, Brother Winston, and all of the ministers, and all the people, I want to thank you for your fine cooperation of, to me, one of the outstanding conventions I've ever preached at in all my life has been this one. I've had more freedom to speak at liberty without any binding. Just felt just exactly at home like I stand at the tabernacle in the pulpit in my own church. And I felt better and in this convention than I have in any and I, as far as I can remember. It's been a one that I'll never forget. The Lord bless you for your prayers and cooperation. And I certainly appreciate it. It's my looking forward to being with you again next year if the Lord provides. Again, wherever it will be held, I don't know. The Lord will provide that. And I want to say that I certainly appreciate this and I appreciate this convention because now I have been accused of being against denominational churches. But that is wrong. I am not against nothing but sin. See? I, I, I just, I'm not against any denomination or any people. I'm just as much Methodist as I am Baptist, Pentecostal, anything else. I'm your brother. I, I, I just don't make any difference. Now, sometimes I rake hard on denominations. It's because of their selfish attitude when they pull themselves up in a little shell and say, we got it. None of the rest of you can have it. You cannot organize Pentecost. And when we try to make an organization out of Pentecost, we displease God. We call ourselves the Pentecostal this organization, the Pentecostal that, but that's wrong. Pentecost is an experience, and it's no organization. And so, but sometimes different groups, to make their groups big, and it's just a worldly expression. But in every group that I've ever come into in my life, I've found genuine Holy Ghost-filled men and women. Yes, sir, of all of them. And made this convention ever hold its standard of independent so that you, all the groups can come together. The free Pentecost and the free Baptists, the free Methodists, and uh, the oneness, twoness, threeness, and uh, all the rest of them. And, and riding on a one-hump camel, a two-hump camel, or a three-hump camel, whatever you want to ride on, come on. You know, Jacob dug one well, and the Philistines drove him away from it, and he called it, I believe, malice. We'll say that. I don't remember just what it was. He dug another well, and the Philistine drove, it away from, uh, drove him away from it, and he called it strife. And Jacob dug another well, and he called it, there's room for all. <laughs> That's the well. That's the independence. The where there's room for all. Everybody, whosoever will, any church, any creed, any denomination, we're here to represent the Pentecostal blessing that comes to the Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, Jew, whatever you are. It comes to yellow, black, white, brown, all races, all creeds, all peoples at any time that you're ready for it. May it always remain that way, is my prayer. Now, don't forget, tonight ends the convention, and the brethren will be going home, many of them, I suppose. Now, I did not know that I was going to uh, be praying for the sick at, at night, so I thought I would hang over two more nights in order to pray for the sick that come to the convention. But I noticed on a little circular down there at a found setting in a filling station window that said prayers for the sick each night. I found that when Brother Joseph and I yesterday was walking by. So then last night we started praying for the sick. I didn't know uh, I was to pray for the sick. So then if you're here and you're not in no hurry to get home, you're certainly welcome to stay with us for Saturday night and Sunday afternoon. We're going to close a Sunday afternoon because we do not want to hold the people from their churches on Sunday night. To your denomination and to your own choice of church, that's your duty to stand at your post of duty. Exactly. For your pastor and uphold him as a man of God. If he doesn't see the light yet, don't fall out with him. Love him and pray for him. That's the thing to do to get him into it. That's right. If you're, if you 
with a church that doesn't believe in the Pentecostal blessing, well, that doesn't hurt a thing. You go right on and keep, you receive the Pentecostal blessing, and then tell your pastor about it and tell him how sweet it is, and the first thing you know, he'll be like Brother Collins the other night, the Methodist preacher, when he got the Holy Ghost. He had to go get his brother and his sister-in-law and all of them, they got the Holy Ghost. So that's just the way it goes. See? We don't never want to take anybody away from a church. We don't want to say, let all the one church join this other church. That's not it. Stay right where you're at. That's all right. As long as they'll receive you and you got the blessing, you stay right where you are. But try to have fellowship with one another. That's what it is. It's a fellowship of brethren, brethren, to be in fellowship. I believe everybody believes that, don't you? Sure. That's fine. Now, I was going to announce what I was going to speak on tomorrow morning, but I, I better leave that alone, because I, I, I say I'm going to speak on something, then I go there and get something else, see? I just have... I, if I could preach like I do when I'm cutting my grass or going on a hunting trip somewhere, get up in the mountains and walk up top of the mountains and stand up there and look out across and feel that breeze high in the mountains and hear the coyote holler, whew, my, if I could preach like I could right there, sit down on that rock and get off the rock and walk around the tree and preach and carry on, if I could preach like that up here, I'd be a, I'd be a pretty fair preacher, I believe. <laughs> I get out in the yard cutting grass, and I just have to stop sometimes, stop no more, and run into the garage and say, Lord, help me. I don't want to act like that out there in the yard. People think I lost my mind. <laughs> but then when I get up here, I forget all about it. What was I thinking about, you see? <laughs> then I just have to depend on Him. So that's the reason sometimes that I can't say what I'm going to speak on, but the Lord will help me do something anyhow. Now, let us turn tonight to for the text, if I should call it that, in 1 Samuel, the seventh cha- or the 8th chapter, and begin with the 4th verse, 1 Samuel, the 8th chapter, and the beginning with the 4th verse, let us read. Then all the elders of Israel gathered to themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But this this pleased Samuel. When they said, Give us a king to judge us, and Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. If I was going to title this for a few moments, and then we're going to take up our cards for prayer, for the sick, right where we left off last night. And then tomorrow night, tomorrow afternoon, there will be prayer cards given out, another prayer line tomorrow night, and Sunday at 2 o'clock, 2.30, prayer cards will be given out at 2 then, Sunday afternoon for Sunday afternoon service, having prayer for the sick. I want to entitle this subject tonight, The Rejected King. And I wish we had chairs to accommodate or seat somehow the ones that are standing all around tonight, uh, this uh, building. But I will try to hurry so that you won't have to stand too long. But if you'll just give me your undivided attention for a, a few moments. In the day of Samuel, the people were a great deal like they are in all days. They had come to a place that they wanted to be like the other people. And that is just simply a nature with people.
People want to impersonate each other. If you go out and buy a certain kind of clothing or a certain automobile, paint your steps a certain color in your house or on your steps, porch steps, watch the neighbor. They just can't stand it. They've got to be the same. You go to church and wear a certain kind of a hat that's a little different. Next Sunday, you'll have a lot of your sisters with that same kind of hat if they can find it. Somehow or another, they just want to act like one another. And that's a good thing if it's used right. If it is used in the right way. Now, but these people, in the days of Samuel, the prophet, they wanted to act like the Philistines and the Amalekites and the unbelieving. And they, because that they seen their people was a little more fancy, and they were a nation of called out and chosen people. And they are not supposed to act like the rest of the people. God's people is never to act like the world or look like the world or be anything to do with the world. Amen. You are a separated people, the church, a called out, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Altogether different and set aside in all your actions and habits and ways from the things of the world. Now may the Lord help us as we study. Now these people seen how the Philistines were doing, how the Amalekites and the different ones were acting, and they came to Samuel and said, We want to be like them. And it's about the same today. Uh, you just let the world start a certain fashion or, or some fad, and you find all the people, even to many of the Christians, want to do that same thing. They want to act like it. You let the boys start cutting their hair a certain way, and all the boys want to do it. And they got to a place now, they let their hair grow out real big and looks like a duck or something sitting on top of their head. <laughs> and I tell you, I believe that I, I, if I was a woman, a girl, and a boyfriend of mine did like that, I'd set him down and shave his hair off. <laughs> it looks to me like that a woman would want a man. I tell you, maybe... The woman is so masculine that she wants something feminish, but that certainly looks like a woman to me. They have all that big bush like a duck or a crow or something sitting on top of their head, the big long thing sticking out in the back, and i never seen such an outfit in my life. And I've seen some preachers like that. What in the world is this thing coming to? After a while, they'll have a beatneck pastor if you don't watch out what they're doing. Well, that's the truth. Oh, the church has to act just like the world. It must be, now that was rude, and I, I don't mean it that way, see. But I'm just trying to make a, I'm trying to drive a nail down so tight it won't come out till the clinch on the other side. If it hurts, maybe I'll back up just a little bit. But it's got to be clinched to make it whole. Is that right, Brother Woods? He's a contractor. You've got to make it whole by clinching it. And I, I think a man ought to be a man. And a woman ought to be a lady. Amen. And I think that a Christian ought to act like a Christian and associate with Christians. Amen. And the church of the living God ought to be together with one heart and one accord and have nothing to do with the world when it comes to their ways and habits. But we find it today, just like it was then, they come to Samuel and they said, Now you're getting old, your hair's getting gray. And we, we just don't know how much longer you're going to stay around. And now we want you to make us a king just like 
the Philistines has got, like all the rest of the world has got. Make us just like them. And it displeases this holy prophet of God. Any prophet, if he is a prophet, he's for holiness and righteousness and the things of God. He can't stand still. He's got to bring it out. Sometimes it costs his life, but he, he, he'll bring it anyhow. Because God is in the person. And the pastor or prophet that really, for God, if it hurts it just, he, he don't mean to hurt the people. He loves the people, but he's trying to save them. Thing. And while this uh, kind of upset the good old prophet that they thought he was too old to go on, we find out he lived for many, many years later. But he was, uh, he was a servant of the Lord. And in doing that, they rejected their real king, which was God. And that displeased the prophet. And he didn't want him to do that. Now, Samuel, in our message, represents the Holy Spirit. Now, Samuel was the mouthpiece of God. And today, the Holy Spirit is the mouthpiece of God. And today, instead of having all of our different fangdangles in church, God wants us to let Him rule. Not popes, bishops, and general overseers and doctrines and denominations and everything. He sent the Holy Spirit to rule the church. But we, like the people of old, we say, well, let us be like the rest of them. They've got a great organization. Let's just build up our group because we believe this. Now, the Holy Spirit never would have stood still for that. No, sir. The Holy Spirit wants us to have no fences, no boundary lines. He wants us to be one in Him. We are children, brothers. God doesn't separate his children and say, I'll give this and cornbread and beans and this and ice cream and pie. He doesn't do that. Amen. Let this and starve to death and the other thing. He feeds them all at the same table. And the Holy Spirit should lead the church. But they didn't want it that way. They, they wanted a king. They wanted to be like the rest of the world. And when the Pentecostal church, the Holy Spirit, first fell about 50-something years ago, if they would have just let it alone and let God add to the church daily such as would be saved, it would have been like it was in the apostolic age. But we had to draw fences. We had to be like the rest of them. We had to, if the Methodist is a denomination, we must be. And here comes somebody along and said, Jesus is coming on a white cloud. No, he's coming on a white horse. All right, we'll just separate. I'll get me a group and you get you a group. There you are. What difference does it make? He's coming anyhow. And no matter how he's coming, the thing of it is, are you ready to go with him when he comes? That's the main thing. Doesn't matter how he comes, what form he comes in. Let's just be ready to go. But they'll split hairs on little bitty things and form another organization. And that's just the way the world did it. And good old Samuel, he took it to the Lord and he said, Lord, what can I do about these matters? The people are determine that they must have it just that way. And we, we must, we, we don't know just what to do about this. And the Lord said, go right ahead and give them their, uh, give them their king because they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me to be their judge. See, people don't want the Holy Spirit to judge them. No, no, you don't want that. They want, uh, they want some creed to judge them. But they want some church to judge them. But they don't want the Holy Spirit. And he said, go ahead and make them a king. So they searched out through the country and down in the tribe of Benjamin. They found a man by the name of Kish who had a son named Saul. And they chose him. Great, big, handsome looking, intellectual, giant of a man head and shoulders above any other man, way up high, intellectual, educated, smart, shrewd, nice looking. Oh, that was just exactly what they wanted, something they could show off with. That's just about the way the churches is getting. Amen. You want some great big organization, some great big fine church, bigger than the little mission down yonder. That's just the way it goes. Amen. And many times they leave the little mission where the Spirit is leading, to go join to that because you say, I belong to the first church. 
See, the same old devil, just exactly the same misleading other people. The biggest church, something to show off, something big. All people like to say that. They like to get to a place where they got the finest pastor, while they got a pastor that's got four degrees out of uh, uh, Princeton or some great university. He's so smart and everything like that. He might have all those degrees, but in God's sight, he might not even be enough to make a hog collar. That's exactly right. With all those. God. God chooses man, and he is our king. God, the Holy Spirit, was sent to govern the Pentecostal believers. The Holy Spirit believers. The king God was sent to do that. Now, they chose him, and he was a great man. Fine fellow, just exactly what they wanted. That was the guy. Now, they, before they... Uh, Anointed him king, they made him chief captain just to give him a tryout. He was a failure to start with, to begin with. It wasn't in God's program. But however, when they chose him, finally it was going to make him king, Samuel told him, he said, now go on. First, if you choose to be, have a king and reject God, you know what's going to take place? Here he says what's going to take place. He'll call all your sons and daughters to be his servants. You'll pay a tenth of all you got to feed his army. And your fine vineyards and all your fine cattle will be taken over and everything. And that's the way it'll be. You'll have to have armor barriers. You'll have to have soldiers. Your daughters will be cooks and confectionaries to feed the soldiers. And that's the way it'll be. Oh, that's all right. But we want him anyhow. We want him anyhow. Then... He called him to a place before anointing Saul king. He said, I want to ask you something. In other words, let me put it like this. Have not I been with you since a child as a prophet? Have I ever took any of your money? Have I ever begged you for anything? No. Have I ever spoke to you in the name of the Lord but what had come to pass? No, that's right, Samuel. All that you have done has been of the Lord. Well then, why don't you let God be your king? Oh, we know that you're the prophet. We know that you're the servant of God. We know that you speak the truth. And we know that you're right. You've been the right kind of a judge and everything over us. Father, through the Holy Spirit. But still, we want the king. Oh, brother, when people get their heads set on something, they're just going on anyhow. There's just hardly anything you can do. They've just got their mind made up. They're going to do it whether it's right or wrong. Well, you can stand and preach to people that it's wrong for their women to dress immoral, for a man to go and women to go to dances, for this rock and roll stuff. They'll take right out of there like a hog to its water and a dog to its vomit. It's exactly right. Pay no more attention to it and nothing in the world. Because they are determined they're going to do it anyhow. They say they want it anyhow. All right. So they, after all the warnings had been given, then finally they wanted a king anyhow, so Saul was anointed king. The first thing taking place, the enemy slipped in on one side and put the right eye out of a lot of the people of God. You know the story. It's found here in Samuel 8, 9, and 10. Put the right eye out. That's just what the enemy wants to do. That's what the enemy's trying to do tonight. Put the right eye of God's people out. You notice it was the right eye. The one is spiritual. If he can put the spiritual sight out of your eye, where you see the natural things and not the spiritual things, he's got you whipped right there. As long as you can have churches and big places and fine intellectual dress people and so forth, as long as your eye looks like that and don't see the spirit side, the enemy's got you under his control because you don't know where you're going. Amen. 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 Brother, listen, what we need today is an old-time backwood sin-killing revival. The Bible, Holy Ghost, back into the church again with the power of God over the audience and the people filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what we need today. And if that would take place, every wall of denominational difference would be broke down. The oneness, twoness, threeness, church of God, pilgrim holiness, Nazarenes, all of them together would be shouting and eating off the same apple. Well, they would, 
they would be so brotherly and sisterly, there would be not even one thought of it. But see, we want to pattern after something of the world. That same thing got into our nation. Our nation used to be governed by real, true politics. Christians that go together and pray and come out anointed and try to govern our nation. Now it's just as honeycombed as it can be with everything. Amen. Crooked. They tell me that communists is all over the country, free thinkers, and all them kind of stuff of organizations rising up. And it's just in such a state there's no stop to it. And it only shows one thing, that the true King, the Son of God, is coming to take over and reign. Amen. Just as certain as we're in this convention tonight. Amen. Oh, if people could only remember, no matter how long you stay here on earth, still you've got to meet God. You take and make God your King, your Supreme Lord. Many people like to see, receive Jesus as Savior. Oh, yes, I don't want to go to hell, so I, I'll take him as my Savior, but not your Lord. When he's Lord, he's got rulership. Amen. He comes right in and governs you and controls you. But you say, Lord, you can be my Savior, but don't go to meddling in my private business. Now, don't go to get into all these things. Uh, you don't want your private life. You don't want to surrender it all to God. And that's true, friends. And whatever you do, when you leave this convention, you leave this meeting, you go home with one determination that you're going to seek God day and night and live in His presence. Get away from the things of the world. Oh, yes. They wanted this king. And when they got the king, then the enemy began to put the eyes of the people out. And then they couldn't see where they were going. That's the first thing the devil does when he can get a servant of God. He blinds him to the fact that he's lost. Amen. That's the first thing the enemy done when they got Samson, another judge. They put his eyes out where he couldn't see where he was going. As soon as the enemy of the Philistines come in upon Israel, they put their right eye out so they couldn't see good where they were going. When the enemy comes into a church, he puts their eyes out to the real facts that the Holy Spirit is the one who rules and governs the church. All discipline is brought by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, I wish I could say the words that would make it go home to the right place. See, that it never would leave. Clinch in there. God gave the Holy Spirit to rule and govern the church. Amen. The Holy Spirit. Now, now when this taken place, they put the right eye out. Did you notice that cunning little thing that Saul done? Oh, he was a slick article. Because what did he do? He sent out all around over the country pieces of, of an ox that he had killed and said, let all the people follow me and Samuel. Oh, my. Me and Samuel. See, he put Samuel, used Samuel's good reputation to deceive the people. And many times today, and our leaders does the same thing. They put it in our churches. They say, why, so-and-so, our founder, he believed, he did this. Yes, he was a good man. But, brother, something's happened since then. Amen. That's right. What happened? You Methodists that used to lay under the power of God all night long when Asbury and, and, and John and Charles was here in the United States, they were called holy rollers and put out of the, of the real churches, the big churches, laid out there in the schoolhouses, and the people, they preached under the power of God until the people would fall out in the floor and they'd throw water in their face and fan them back and forth. That's, that's, I've seen them do it. John Wesley preaching divine healing. One of his little books. A uh, man from the Anglican church turned a fox and a foxhounds loose amongst his congregation and John pointed his finger in that man's face and said, The sun will not set on your head three times till you'll call for me to pray for you. And that evening, the man died with cramps in his stomach, calling for John to come pray for him. And today you talk about a healing service amongst the Methodist people. Some Methodist man was writing a thesis on a book right, uh, here some time ago about divine healing. He said, There's only one fault the message can find with you, Brother Branham. I said, What's that? He said, One thing that all that come to your meeting nearly is Pentecostal. I said, all right, well, let's change it. You Methodist sponsor me and I'll come to you. 
I said, will you start it in your city? Well, he said, of course. I, I said, that's what I thought. See, just exactly. God will send his message to somewhere. It will not return to me, void. It will accomplish that which I have purposed. God is able these stones to rise children to Abraham. But they refer back to some great fellow, Moody or Wesley or some great person like that, where they sprung up from. Now, that's the same trick that Saul done. Who will not follow Samuel and I? Who will not follow Samuel and I? Let it be. Well, that's just a, a smooth trick they, they try to pull. But Samuel still, he told the people not to do this. But they did it anyhow because they, they wanted to do it. They said they would do it anyhow. And I was just looking here on the scripture where it said here that, that Samuel, when he almost persuaded the people that they were doing what was wrong. And then they went ahead and wanted to do it. Then when they got this thing taking place, then Saul won this victory and he sent out and told all the Hebrews what they should look for, what the Hebrews had done. And it really wasn't Saul that won the battle. It was his son, Jonathan that won the battle. Then we find again that when this man saw, the first thing you know, he got great then, stuck out his chest. Certainly, we built this big thing. We done this. And when he done it, then he got to a place he didn't want Samuel's advice anymore. He'd done it the way he wanted to do it. And that's what's happened today. The people has got to a place that they don't want to do it the way that God wants to do it. They want to do it the way they want to do it. Amen. That's what's the matter today. God wants divine healing among his people. Amen. The big high fellow says, now wait a minute, the days of miracles is past. Yeah. Now, what caused Saul to do that? When he got to a place that he took over the leading of the people instead of letting the, uh, the Holy Spirit. Now, Samuel told him, he said, now if you go ahead and have your king... And you'll all live right and keep God's commandments and do what the Lord says and follow the Spirit. Saul will be able to preach us some mighty good messages. And he did. They had no right to disbelieve Samuel because Samuel always prophesied the truth to them. Amen. He told them what was the truth. But he said, now if you just let uh, Saul and all of you follow the leadings of the Spirit, keep the commandments of the Lord, everything will be all right. If that taken place tonight... In every church in the United States, there would be a revival start in this nation. I tell you, whiskey joints would be broke up. It would be, it would be one of the most grandest things that this nation's ever known. If every preacher of all denominations would just follow the leading of the Holy Spirit instead of some creed of their denomination. What some bishop said or somebody else said or somebody else said, what somebody else said has nothing to do with to it. God sent the Holy Spirit, and He's our God. He's our leader. But when they even see the Holy Spirit moving, they get scared of it. They don't know what it is. It's a stranger to them because they're not taught in that line. They're taught to stop on a certain thing that the church believes, and they go on right like that and go through life, call themselves Christians, and go on with the things of the world. And then when they come to die, they say, Well, my faith saves me. I said to a man some time ago, I said, Sir... Didn't the Lord ever condemn you for that smoking? Oh, he said, no. And I said, I have seen you drink myself. He said, but look here, preacher, I want to tell you something. I visited another man in the room. He said, my faith saves me. I said, but mister, let me tell you something now. Faith without works is dead. And I said, the Holy Spirit don't live a life like that. See? And I said, you may be disappointed. I said, now the faith's all right. But if the works don't follow the faith, then the faith's no good. And when you die, it, remember, it doesn't change your spirit. It only changes your dwelling place. And whatever type of spirit you got in you, that's the place it will go to. And sin can never enter heaven. So if you, you say, well, I confess mine every night. We got a prayer book. And when we go to church, we confess all of our sins. And turn right back around and do them again. Turn right back the next day, God, forgive me for drinking. Forgive me for committing adultery. Forgive me for lying. Forgive me for stealing. Turn right back and do the same thing. 
forgive me for getting drunk last week. You didn't mean to drink that much. Turn right back around and drink it again. Well, that's not, that shows that something hasn't changed inside. You're trying to paint the outside. Kind of whitewash it. But what it needs to be done is put in the blood of Jesus Christ and washed white instead of whitewashed. That's, that's what the, the world needs today. But then we find out then that because it, Saul took upon himself, Samuel was a little late one day to offer the burnt offerings, which was only legal for him to do under the inspiration of God. And Saul said, why do we have to wait on him? He went and offered it himself. He started leading the people himself instead of letting God lead the people. That's where he made his mistake. That's where every church that's ever been organized yet made their fatal mistake. I've never seen an organization. I've, I've took history. I've read all the way from the pre-Nicene fathers and Josephus and all the early historians. I've never seen one time where a church ever come into a great spiritual revival and fell and got away from it and ever rose again. Amen. I want you to show me where is that. God, if they won't follow the light, God will lay it right up on the shelf and let somebody, God's able of these stones to rise, children of Abraham. Yeah. Luther was the light of his day, but they got a group in there in that Lutheran church and twisted the scriptures around to make it fit their own theology. And the first thing you know, the Lutheran church was on the shelf. The revival was over. God raised up the Methodists. The Methodists come out with sanctification, had a great revival, world sweeping, one of the greatest the world's ever had in the days of of John Wesley, and a great revival swept the land. By the time John and Charles and Asbury and all those died off, we got a new group in there, begin to think a lot about, well, we ought to do this, a, a blood religion and all this kind of stuff. And the first thing you know, they begin to bring in all kinds of creeds and things. And now look where it's at, laying on the shelf. Oh, yes. And the Pentecostal has done the very same thing that they did, just exactly. Going the way of all flesh. Yes, you want to be like the world. Don't be like the world. We are different. Yeah. Servants of God are different. They're born again. They're new creatures in Christ. You have no right to take the things of the world and mix it with Christianity. The Christian robe's not made up of church-made theology. The Christian robe's made up of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and nothing less than that. And a life to follow that baptism of the Holy Ghost. Makes you live right, do right, act right, talk right, live right. That is true. But then when Saul wouldn't wait on the Lord no more, Samuel turned right away from him. Remember, at the first time, not the second time, but the first time that Saul took upon himself to take over the service of the Lord, Samuel turned his back on him and walked away from him. And the first time that the church lets their leaders take over to lead the people, the Holy Spirit gets right away from them. And the very first time that you're going to be led by a man instead of God, the Holy Spirit will get away from you too. Let the Holy Spirit lead. That's what we need is leadership. And God gave us a leader and we don't hear it. Here not long ago I was reading and a brother Gene brought it to me, I believe. And one of the magazines about geese leaving Canada. And they have a, a leader. And if this leader isn't a real good leader, they haven't picked a good one. He'll take them anywhere. Take them over the mountain way and they'll all die. Here some time ago a bunch flew a, an old gander that didn't know where he was going, didn't know his directions. His instinct wasn't just right. He flew a bunch of geese all the way to England. They've never been able to come back. They, they, their nature is to migrate every year. And they just get together and squawk and holler and carry on over there in England. And they don't know how to get back home. What's in their mind is some of these cold formal borgs that we got today. Get so far away from God you don't know how to get back. You'll never come back by creeds. You've got to have inspiration to lead your brother. And that inspiration comes by the Holy Ghost. 
Yes, led of the Spirit. Sons and daughters of God are led by the Spirit of God. They love the Spirit. They don't try to say, now, wait a minute. In my church, they don't say amen. <laughs> my church, they never raise their hands. They're very quiet. While we'd give our pastor chills and fever if somebody hollered amen. Well, you ought to chill him up once in a while, man. Just find out what would take place. That's right. What we need today is a good old heartfelt religion. Let me tell you something. If a baby is born and that baby don't cry, it don't whine, it don't open his little mouth and say a thing, what, uh, nothing happens, what's the matter with that baby? He's born dead. I think we got too many stillbirths today uh, uh, in the church. Father, come up and say, do you believe God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heavens and earth, Jesus Christ, His Son? Yes, I do. Will you promise to do so and so for this church? Yes. Take his little salt shake and a few little drops of water. Give him the right hand of fellowship. Put him in the church. That's stillborn babies. Yeah. That's right. What do you happen to a baby when he's born? If he don't cry as soon as he drops into the earth, what's the first thing you do to him? Is pick him up, turn him over your arm, and give him a little, um, what did you call it? You're paddling. That's right. Give him a few raps like that. And the first thing you know, wah, out he'll go. And you got a baby living. And that's what it needs today in the church. It's not somebody saying, now, I know it might not be all right to do that little sissified thing. <laughs> you need a man behind the pulpit that'll tell you, that'll tear you to pieces. Tell you I get to squall out once in a while and let God come in and let something take place. Then you're born. That's somebody, a baby around your sins and say, oh, well, that our, our forefathers believe that. Our forefathers, our Bible said it's right. That's what's right. It's our Bible. And the same Holy Ghost that fell on the day of Pentecost, which we all know that that was the birth of the new church. If that same Holy Spirit don't bring the same experience to you, then you've got a different Holy Spirit from what that was. Exactly right. If it don't make you live a sacrificial life and a life full of joy and pleasure and the baptism of the Spirit leading you into signs and wonders and miracles and things, there's something happened. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. Look how they perverted it today when man leaves. Here's a good church member. Oh, I know he does this. Oh, I know he does that. But he's a deacon in the church and uh, he does this and that and the other. But I tell you, he certainly, when we come time for we, us to have our missionary program, never fails to put in a $500 check. And if we got a repair to do, oh, he's a fine fella. Then stand there with your collar turned around and preach his funeral someday over a half mass flag. Say he's gone to heaven. Ain't that a sinful thing? Let me tell you something. What we need today is new birth, new life, new creatures in Christ. What a difference. A man said that long ago, a preacher told me that he had to take a member in his church secretly. Said he's a good man, but said he just couldn't stand out before that audience and, and be brought into church. Said I, I had to take him into the prayer room in the back and take him into the church secretly. So what do you think about that, Billy? I said I ought to turn him right straight towards you and kicked him just as hard as I could. That's the way I took him in. That's right. I was going down to the river here some time ago to baptize a woman. And there's a whole group going along with me. And so the woman going along there, she said, Brother Branham? I said, yes. She said, well, I finally decided for you to go down and duck me. I said, what's that? She said, you're, you're going to fix me up this afternoon and duck me, aren't you? And I said, no, ma'am. Before I do that, I said, you've got to get your heart right with God. I wouldn't baptize you on no conditions. You're still alive in the world yet. You've got to be dead. We only bury dead people. Those who are dead in Christ and ready to rise to new life again. And a person make a remark like that against baptism isn't a fit candidate for water baptism. Right. Well, there's where we go. We find out the Spirit. Saul said, I'll do it myself. I know how to do it. I know as much about it as that old fogey Samuel. And Samuel had proved that he was a servant of God. He proved that the Holy Spirit was with him. For he said, I'll take you to record this day. Have I ever spoke to you anything in the name of the Lord but what come to pass? Have I ever come and begged and bummed money from you? And all these great things. No, they said, you haven't done that. But still, we, we want to have it the way we want it, see. And that's then, you see, what they were getting then. Now, we find out then when a man rejects the leading of the Holy Spirit, you know what God did for Saul? He gave him an evil spirit to lead him. 
Now, how about that? He gave him an evil spirit. God gave him an evil spirit to lead him. So when a man rejects the leading of the Holy Spirit, or any person rejects the leading of the Holy Spirit, you've got a devil on you to lead you. It's exactly the Bible. Oh, God, I wish we could have a revival. I wish there could come a time that when the Holy Spirit could really get into the hearts of the American people again, that they would see it's Him. They want to look say, well, now, look, I can't cooperate in this meeting because my church don't... What difference does that make? What's that got to do with it? Well, I'll tell you, uh, they, they believe in this and we don't believe that. As long as they're preaching the Bible and the whole Bible and the full gospel and nothing but the truth, listen to it. As long as they're led by the Spirit, believe in it. And God will make Himself known. If a man is led by the Spirit of God, God will make Himself known to that person. Yes, sir, God promised to. So in doing that, we know then that that the Holy Spirit leads the people and God takes care of it. Amen. Amen. You believe that with all your heart? Certainly we do. All right. Then I'd like to say another thing. That evil spirit began to lead Saul. And it led him. And today when the Holy Spirit's rejected, it wants, what will it do? You'll get an evil spirit to lead you. Now listen, I don't want to hurt you, but I want you to get this. See, just as it was in them days, so is it today. They don't want the Holy Spirit to lead them, so they get an evil spirit. What takes place with the evil spirit? The evil spirit is, wants, to lead, wants to lead them then. And now what? They don't want, they didn't want God to be their judge. And people today don't want the Holy Spirit to judge them. That's the reason they turned Samuel down, because his judgment was of God. It was scriptural. And he'll want to be led by the Spirit. And they turned it down for an ecclesiastical man. And what did they get? An evil spirit to lead them. Now, the people today don't want to be led by the Holy Spirit. They don't want the Holy Spirit to judge them. Now, that's true, friends. They don't want the Holy Spirit to judge you. And then people said to me, a woman said to me not long ago, I was preaching real hard, and I was bawling the sisters out for cutting their hair. And tell them that the Bible said that she was a prostitute if she did so. She is, she is unfair to her husband, and he had a right to put her away. So that's exactly what the Scripture says. Any woman that will cut her hair off of her head, she dishonors her husband. The Bible said, which is her head. And you can preach to him. That lady met me outside, and she said, Let me tell you something right now, preacher. You're sure going to ruin your ministry. I said, Any ministry that the Word of God will ruin ought to be ruined. That's exactly right. She said, well, she said, everybody walk away and leave you. I said, as long as he stays with me, that's the main thing, you see. Let him stay. And uh, sure, they don't want the people, you don't, because they want to be like the world. They don't want, women don't want to dress like the people of God, decent, moral. Well, here a few weeks ago, I went to a Pentecostal meeting. Now, you Baptists get ready to shout in Presbyterians. I went to one of the leading Pentecostal churches of the United States. And my associate and I was sitting there. To, I was going to have a Sunday morning service. And when they know that I'm always against that kind of stuff. And then when they let Sunday school out, I was sitting out there in a the parking lot. Here come the Sunday school teachers. No, no that, ain't, that ain't Methodist. That's Pentecost. Real short bobbed hair and makeup all over their face. Looked like they'd been eating red beef steak and got all over their fingernails and, and all out like that. All that paint and manicure on them walking out there. And here come man my age with that brick top haircut and duck tailed in the back like that. Brother, if I had a congregation like that, I'd sure tear them to pieces, brother. It sure would be. Yes, sir. Oh, they weren't going to stay and listen to the Holy Roller preach and then claim to be Pentecost. A uh, guy up there and the Sunday school teacher come out and said, Good morning, Reverend Branham. And all the, that red stuff on the face and this black pencil over their eyes and, and all, all the, and dressed so sexy like. And they say, Well, now wait a minute, Brother Branham, that's the only kind of clothes you can buy. They still sell goods and sewing machines, so they're, they're not a bit of an excuse for you. That's right. If you're led by the Holy Spirit, straighten up. They don't want the Holy Spirit to judge them. They don't want, there's no excuses. God won't listen to your excuses. He wouldn't listen to Saul's and he won't listen to you. 
You've got to compare with what the Bible said. I think any woman ought to be clean. She ought to look her best. Any man ought to, too. Look pretty and clean, but be decent. You know, if you dress yourself, just that old clothes that people wear, them old shorts. And woman said to me sometime ago, said, Brother Ben, I don't wear them shorts that I wear slacks. I said, that's worse. It's worse. You know what God said? It's an abomination in the sight of God for a woman to put on a garment that pertains to a man. And God is God and never changes. He's the infinite God. If it once made a sickening, stinking smell before him, it still makes a stinking, stinking smell to see a woman put on a garment that pertains to a man. He made man, man, and made women. If he doesn't preach it that way, that's what the Bible said. It's exactly right. Oh, they don't want that. One lady said to me, said, well, do you think it's wrong for a woman to wear some this makeup? I said, yes, sir. I do. I said, face, God, never, if he'd have made, wanted you to look like he's a barn, he'd have made you a barn. I said, I'll paint it up like that. If he wanted you to smoke, he'd put a smokestack on top of you and some flu so that you could uh, breathe it out. But he, he'd give you lungs to breathe good fresh air. That's what he did it for. But they, oh no, but you, they don't want nobody, they don't want the Holy Spirit to judge them. Now, if you get the Holy Ghost and can still live that way, you come to me and tell me you got the Holy Ghost and living like that, uh, I can't be your judge, but according to the Word, you've missed a line somewhere, brother. Amen. That's exactly what the Spirit says. See? Yes. That's right. We need back holiness again, brother. We need to come back to God. Yes, they reject it. Certainly they do. They don't want to know how that they don't want to... Uh, come under the jurisdiction of the Holy Spirit. They don't want the Spirit to guide them. Let me tell you something, ladies. I'm not making fun of you. This is no place for that. This is the place where judgment goes forth. And judgment has to go right. And judgment's by the Word of God. Looking, there was only one woman in the entire Bible that ever painted her face. That's right. One woman. And she never painted her face to meet God. She painted her face to meet a man. To try to vamp him. That's right. Jehu, Jezebel. You know what God did for her? He fed her to the dogs. That's right. So when you see a woman wearing makeup, you say, that's Miss Dog Meat. That's exactly what it is for God. He fed her to the dogs. So that's all she's fit for. Wear dogs. He fed her to the dogs. How many knows that's the truth? Say amen. amen. That's exactly right. So you see how those heathen traits get into the church? It's because some lukewarm son of Kish stands behind the pulpit and is afraid of his meal ticket to preach the truth. Brother, let me tell you, we need men behind the pulpit and not a bunch of theological sissies that's afraid of something to say to the people. We need men of courage, good men, filled with the Holy Ghost that stands there that will not preach sissified stuff and creeds and denominations, but will preach the gospel and shuck the hide off of them. That's exactly right. Right. You little old kid say, now, Junior, honey, don't you do that. Get you a stick and skinny. Hey, That's what you mean. Look what you raised up out of that Junior, honey. Little Martha, you know, stomp her feet and tell her, Mammy, you go shut up. I ain't going to do that. Oh, boy. Good thing they didn't have my daddy. <laughs> run yes sir all this stuff see what you got a bunch of juvenile idiots Amen. just exactly what you got insane Amen. just exact for insane silent filling up with them Amen. beat necks that's what caused junior dear Amen. the bible said if you spare the rod you spoil your son that's right. exactly right and god knows what's truth and what's best Amen. samuel tried to tell saul that god knows what was best but saul said well, the people want me. That's, that's it. As long as you get somebody to follow him, that's all he wanted. He used Samuel's name and get somebody to follow him. That's all he wanted. No, they don't want that real, true gospel. They don't want that real truth. They don't want the Holy Spirit to, um, to guide them. They'd rather have the intellectual pastor. 
See? Now, here's the kind of man they want. Somebody, they don't want, they want somebody that'll in, not tell them it's wrong to do this and wrong to do that and quit doing this and quit doing that. No, they don't want that. But they want a man that's got a theological seminary experience that they can say he's got several degrees and he stands up very nicely and he dresses very nattily, which is perfectly all right. But when he gets there, he kind of does their own interpretation of the Bible, uh, not according to the Bible, but according to some theological seminary's experience. Instead of a baptism of the Holy Ghost down in him to make him shut the hide off. That's exactly right. Amen. Tell me a prophet in the Bible that was a true prophet that didn't shut the hide off. Amen. Tell me whatever come to pass. They didn't want to believe them then, but God gave them signs and wonders to follow them to make the people to vindicate that their ministry was right. It's always been that way. The Holy Spirit today comes right down in the church and said, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, speak with new tongues, take up serpents or drink deadly things, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. When the day of Pentecost is fully come, there's all in one place and one accord. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting, cloven tongues set up on them. Like a fire, and they was all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Out into the streets they went screaming and dancing and acting like drunk people. Just as, and remember, you Catholic people, the Blessed Virgin Mary was among them. Amen. And if she couldn't go to heaven without getting that kind of experience, how are you going to make it? Amen. Think of that. Yes, sir. There she was, all full of the Holy Spirit, like they were drunk, men and women all together. Anything short of that, you're short of Pentecost. Amen. Now, what do they do today? Take it, bring up some old war out letter from four or five different churches that's had it and place it down there and set you in a church and call you a member. <laughs> There's Saul. That's exactly what he did. But Samuel wanted to be led of God. These people go to church on Sunday morning, a pastor to interpret the word. They go right back out there and do what they want to through the week. He tells them they go home after he's given the interpretation of a few things of the church and they say a few creeds. They go home kind of a half satisfied consoling themselves. All my religion is done. It's all right till next week. I'll go down again. Take the communion on Sunday morning. Some bread and grape juice and so forth and whatever they do. And let it go like that. Oh, brother. But now, what did Saul do? He certainly made a great army. He certainly did. He brought Israel to a great army. He made them all with fine, polished spears. He trained them with them spears to fight. Just this right, real gallant man, he made them all big shields and everything. They were real polished and trained all to the very minute. Well, they were getting along fine. The rest of the nation looked at and said, you know, Israel's coming along pretty good. But one day, one day, God don't let it go too long. Amen. Until one day there came a challenger by the name of Goliath, folded his arms, and Israel shook till their shoes were trembling on the ground. That old head and shoulder above all the rest of them shook with him, too. There he stood. He never seen such a thing. The Spirit had to take over. The God of Israel had to show its power. Amen. Oh, yes. There'll be a glass somewhere. We've had one not long ago. We've got some today. I don't understand why. We've got the greatest intellectual, the best dressed crowds. We've got the best theological seminaries, some of the finest trained men that ever come out. They've trained choirs so they can sing, How great thou art to archangels. Couldn't compare with them hardly. Oh, they're trained in the very best of schools and everything like that, knowing all about it. But when it comes to the time of the supernatural, they know nothing of it. God sent a challenger out to show which was right, to show that that thing was wrong. Brother, I say this with godly love and respect. One of our sons of Kish, head and shoulders above all the other evangelists, was called by Mohammed the other day and challenged to the Word of God Amen. and trembled in his shoes and left the ground. Amen. Oh, my! What's the matter? It was something besides theology. It had to bring the supernatural Amen. power of God into it. Amen. He knew nothing about it. Same as it was in the days of Saul. But listen, you true believers in Christ, you true Christians that believe in God and the supernatural, all the time Saul was training this big army and all these intellectuals coming up, God had a little David out there somewhere feeding his father's sheep on sheep food, the Word, not on theological weeds. Right. He had to be standing by when that happened. Oh, my they wanted to give him a seminary experience. 
Saul said, come here, maybe my arm would fit you. He said, take the thing off of me. Well, I'll make you a Bachelor of Art and give you a doctor's degree. He said, I don't know nothing about it. Take the thing off of me. But let me tell you something. I've got this slingshot. Well, that's no comparison. But look here. One day, a lamb was out there feeding one of my father's sheep. Was out there feeding. And a lion come in and got it and packed it off. And I took this slingshot and I trusted in the God of Israel. And I went at him and I knocked him down and slew him and brought that lamb back. Said a bear come in and got a kid and started off with him, one of my fathers, and I put the rock in the slingshot, and it's a little bitty thing, but I, I went after him. I wasn't trusting the slingshot, but I was trusting in the power of the God of Israel. <laughs> Amen. What is that? F A I T H I N J E S U S. That's right. Trusting in the power of the God of Israel. And I knocked that bear down, tucked the line, the little sheep out of his mouth, and took it back. He said, And how much more? <laughs> I, I'm a deliverance minister. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. Listen, they've got some little Davids in the world today. They not be being recognized by Saul's. That's true. But there's some little Davids in the world that's pastoring and feeding God's sheep, sheep food. And one day, a great big cancer come in and got one. The doctor said, well, he's gone. But that little David said, I don't know, I ain't got very much. Just a prayer of faith, but I'm coming at you because you're my father's sheep. I got faith. Hallelujah. I'm coming at you. That was a paralytic stroke hit one. He said, I don't know how I'm going to get it, but I'm coming at you. You're one of my father's sheep. Hallelujah. Don't reject the king of Israel. Glory. He didn't have very much, but he had faith in the God of Israel. Yeah. I'll tell you, they had rejected. They had all their choirs and trained scholars and theology. But when it come for the supernatural, they were stunned. They didn't know nothing about it. Why didn't David know this gallant man? Because he was feeding in another pastor. That's right. He was training under another atmosphere. One day, a, a sickness come in and got one of father's sheep and was going to take it to a premature grave. These little David said, I don't know how I'm going to do it. They said, oh, nonsense, that little slingshot. I might not know how to do it, but it's a promise, and I got faith in it, so I'm coming after that lamb. And he brought it back. Hallelujah. Oh, my. What we need tonight is to get away from all this man-made theology and bring the king back to the faith in the Savior. All this stuff. Yes, sir. Don't you worry. They were afraid to publish the meeting in South Africa. Joseph Bovey did it. When 10,000 Mohammeds sat there and seen a little old twisted boy all twisted up like that, wobbled up to the platform, not even in his right mind. But when they seen the Holy Spirit tell him who he was, what happened and what done it, and when he got through praying, he straightened right up like a man like that. 10,000 Mohammeds laid their trophies to the ground and accepted Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Yes, sir. Look at Tommy Osborne or Roberts. Man who feed the flock on sheep food. The days of miracles is not past, this says the theologians. If the days of miracles is past, the day of God is past. God is a miracle. <clears throat> Certainly. There you are, sheep food. Oh, my poor dejected friend. The devil might have took you, sister, out yonder to a place where you, you never do desire to let your hair grow. Might get you to a place where you think that some pastor is nonsense when he's preaching you pure holiness the way you should dress. Some of you man out there that goes around and does these things that you ought not to do. And you man that'll let your wife do a thing like that and smoke cigarettes. I've got little respect for you even as a man. Now, that's exactly right. You know a man's the head of the house? As long as he takes his place. But we... I, I, don't, I like to see a man a man. Amen. A man's not judged by how many muscles he's got. That's beast. A man's not judged by the brawny muscles, but he's judged by the bags and the knees of his pants where he's been praying. That's what takes a man. A man is character. Not beast, but character. I've seen men that weighed 200 pounds didn't have an ounce of man in them. Amen. Grab a baby out of a mother's arms and ravish her. 
Any man would give a woman a cigarette is little and low down. And knowing that that's one of the greatest fifth colonists that's breaking the backbone of our nation. And these cigarette factories and everything out here putting out cigarettes and whiskey. And, and then they take and write off all their income tax on these advertisements to put out more Tommy Wright on television. And pattern these went, oh God, what's the matter with our country? It's rejected the leadership of the Holy Ghost that wouldn't stand a minute for stuff like that. No wonder sickness and diseases is on the rampage. What we need today is a God, the rejected king, the king of Israel, to ride in among us like this. He might have tucked you like that. There might be sick people here tonight. It's going to stand in this prayer line. They might stand here. Cancer might have tucked you. The devil might have packed you out of the reach of a doctor, your beloved physician. And he's tucked you to a place where you can't come back. That may be so. But let me tell you something, brother. When I bring in this prayer line tonight, I ain't got nothing but a little bit of slingshot called F-A-I-T-H. I'm coming after you. That's right. I'm coming after you. I've seen him bring others back. He'll bring you back too. God, that could heal these people. Other people can heal you. You believe that? Yes, indeed. The same God still is. And we're coming after him tonight. And with the power and faith in Jesus Christ, we'll knock that devil down to the flat and bring him back. Why is it? It's the father's sheep. It's God's little lamb that Satan stole away and said, Ah, he's got a lot of influence. I'll take him away from the church. I'll take her away from the church. Come on, David, let's go. Yes, sir, God promised us the victory. How much more will this uncircumcised, unbelieving Philistine ever stand and defy the word of the living God? Yes, sir. I'd be like the Hebrew children. Our God's able to deliver us, but nevertheless, we won't bow to any images. A formal denominations or nothing else. Amen. I'll come. That's all I can do. I can't say I can bring it back, but I'm coming trying. I'm going to meet him in the name of Jesus Christ with a commission of an angel who come to me and said, if you'll get the people to believe you and be sincere when you pray, nothing shall stand before your prayer. It's done for tens of thousands times, thousands. You poor little sick sheep tonight, I'm coming after you now in the name of Jesus Christ. I'll, I want to bring you back. Away from them old places to the shady green pastures and the still water. Where you can lay down and put a straw in your mouth and look up towards God. So, oh, I got peace like the river. I got peace like the river. Yes. That's what we want to do. Oh, there's more. There's pastors. How many preachers in here that believes in deliverance for, for the sick and the afflicted? Just look at here. You're coming back, little lamb, and I cause we're coming after you. Yes, sir, that devil of a line called cancer, that devil of a line called anything he wants to be called in the medical name, whatever he is, he's a devil. And we've got commission from Jesus Christ. In my name, they shall cast out devils. He better get going because there's many here and we're going to catch him tonight. We're coming to bring you back. How many has those prayer cards? Now raise up your hands. Where's Billy? Get in here over where he's at. Billy Paul, some of you, I want you who's got the prayer cards to stand right down here. Line up just exactly the way you was last night. Just those with prayer cards first, please. As holding prayer cards. You're, all right. Yeah. Yea, the mouth of the Lord has spoken this night, and he doth say unto thee, If thou wilt be willing and obedient, yea, thou shalt eat the good of the land. But if thou dost refuse and rebel, yea, the sword of the Lord shall be thee. thee. For indeed the Lord doth deny to bless thee this night, and heal me and send me on my way rejoicing. Amen. Amen. I'm believing. Have faith. How far down the line was yours, sister? That's right. On your prayer line up. One time, 
David, not just you with the cards. It was your last night. I don't want they didn't give out any tonight. We're going to give them out again tomorrow evening. You with the cards, stand up here just a moment. You that's in your seats to sit real still, just a moment. We're coming after you too. That's right. We're coming in the name of Jesus. You that's standing outside, we're coming after you. Coming in the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm getting tired of this negative and halfway profession. Let's get to business with God. God promised it. God don't keep his word. He's not God. He does keep his word. So he is God. One time when they were standing, David was speaking. Israel was trembling. The enemy was at the gate. Listen how scriptural. And while David was yet speaking, not knowing what was taking place, the spirit fell upon a man and he prophesied and said, go down and lay at a certain place for an ambush. And they, the enemy beat his own self to death right there. They caused a confusion and they whipped their own self and they only went in and got the spoils. Listen, you that's sitting out there in the audience, you don't have to be up here. Just have faith and believe God. You know what will take place? God will cause the enemy to leave you right where you're at. Confusion will come in. He won't know where he's at. A man speaks out and says, hear the word of the Lord. The mouth of the Lord has spoken tonight. And so forth like that. And tell him what to do to obey the commandments of the Lord. These signs shall follow them that believe. My name they shall cast out devils, speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. All these things is promised. It's God's business. And he is the king. Amen. Don't you love him? Praise him. How many loves him? While they're gathering, let's sit real still in our seats now. While they're fixing the prayer line, let's sing this song. All right? I love him. I love him. you all in a prayer line a word. All of you in a prayer line. Sick, needy. Have you prayed over this sincerely? Have you prayed over your sickness? If you have, raise up your hand. You've prayed over it. You believe you prayed through on it? It's God's will to heal you? If you have, raise up your hand. If you prayed through on it, it's going to happen. Amen. Ain't but one thing to do then is cast it away from you when you come by. Oh my I'm afraid the audience is going to think that just the evangelist is the only one who has power to do this. I want a bunch of preachers come here with me. You deliverance ministers that believe in this, come here and stand with me, man. Come here, brother. Just stand and make a little line along here. Come on, brother. Many of you. Come up here and stand along here so you'll see that it's preachers also. I'm not, it's not only me, my brethren here. They're, they have, they're just as much ordained to do this as I am or anybody else. They're servants of God. That's good. Now, I'll tell you what let's do. The people says, brethren, that they have all prayed up on this. They're all ready. That if they prayed up on it, prayed through on it, there's only one thing left. That's cast the enemy away when he comes by. Don't have to pray for him. They've already done the praying. Is that right? Amen. See? So what you see, they ain't a hocus pocus. It's not that. It's the power of God in his word. These men are anointed men. They're men of God. And they pray too. Now, I tell you what, if they've prayed up on it, there's no need of us praying. Just lay your hands on them and cast the enemy away from them. Look, little sheep, we're coming after you. Are you ready to go back? <laughs> Let's go back to good health tonight. Everybody real reverent. How about forming a double line right along here? Let's pass these. Everybody through and pray. And just cast the enemy away. Just say, Satan will. What's that? All right? We'll make a single line. Then. All right, you brother, move right up here. I want each one of you men to lay hands on these people as you come by with me. I want everybody out there to pray while this line is passing through. And I believe you'll see the glory of God. Amen. Will you bow with me and pray with me? Each one of you Davids out now with your slingshot, come on. Now, I don't believe in any crooked shooting. If you haven't got your, li- your sights lined up, zero them in right now. Let's, let's, go for the, let's go for the kill. Look here, God's little sheep. It's not God's will that any of them should be sick. And they prayed up. The only thing they need is a little help. That's all they need. My name, they shall cast out devils. Amen. You believe that? Say amen. Amen. Satan, you might as well turn them loose. They're on the road. 
Let's all bow our heads now and let this audience, these people walk right through here. And when you come by, each one of you, when the first minister touches you, raise up your hand. Praise God, it's over. Come right through here and you'll go down off this platform, the happiest person you ever did. We've come to get you. Are you ready to go? All right. Let us all pray now with our heads bowed. Come out, Pastor Weston. Get right there now. Touch the people. Come out. In the name of the Lord Jesus, may the devil go out. Now pray, pray. This is somebody. This is sheep going by now. Pray and just sit still. Sit real still and pray. Do you love him? Now be real reverent. Just get your seat a minute. I believe solemnly with all my heart and all that's in me that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, makes every one of them well. Do you believe it with me? I believe the prayer of faith is prayed over. The reason I did that so that this congregation and your congregation here, these men of God who stand here, ministers anointed with the Holy Ghost, they have just as much right, just as much authority to pray for the sick and to cast out a devil as anyone else does in the world. How do you believe it? All right. Now, how many is in here that's sick and hasn't got a prayer card and you want God to heal you? Raise up your hand. Still a great bunch. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Do you believe it? These are handkerchiefs. I pray over them just a moment. I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to do something. I thought maybe he would show me someone out in the audience that you'd see each one to come by. That these men, they may not be able to see, get, uh, see visions. They wasn't born for that purpose. But they got the same Holy Spirit. Amen. Same God. Yes. See? But I haven't got no education. Some of those men are smart. But don't think you're the sons of Kisho. They're a man who believe in divine healing, believe the God of heaven. They're a gallant man. 
Certainly they are. And they, they believe in this. They wouldn't stand up here to show you that they believe in it. I want their congregation before this audience breaks. And uh, some of you be going home. I want you to know that your pastor has the same authority. And I want to show you that this is truth. That God made the promise. He is still God. Now you pray and believe. You out there in the audience, see if the Holy Spirit's anointing. See if he's still here. Amen. Oh, I love this. Oh, isn't he wonderful? I just know he's in with us. You just pray and say, Lord, help thou me. Help my unbelief. I see a little woman sitting right down here, shattered with death. She can't live unless God helps her. You're aware of that, aren't you, sister? You. Cancer. Little white rim or flowers around your hat. You have a prayer card, lady. You, don't, you haven't had one, all right, sir? You don't need one. That's the truth. That's what you're suffering with. There's a dark shadow hanging over, over you. Do you believe me to be God's prophet? And Satan, in Jesus Christ's name, turn her loose. I come to meet you. There he goes. The shadow went away from her. Something happened to her. Now the same Holy Spirit can tell her those things. Don't you know he's healed her? Do you feel your healed, sister? Stand up to your feet. Amen. There you are. There you are. If you'll just only have faith and believe, all things are possible to them that believe. If thou canst believe. Is that right? I see a little lady sitting right back in here looking at me. Never seen her in my life. But there, can't you see that light hanging over that woman? Right here. She's praying. She's suffering. She's got high blood pressure. She's got tumors. She's not from here. She's from Chicago. You want to go and get well now, sister? All right. Stand up to your feet. Little redhead there. Go home. Be made well. Jesus Christ heals you. You got it too, sister, when you're in trouble too. God bless you. Go on home now. Be made well. Jesus Christ heals you. You believe with all your heart? Somebody pray. Somebody just say, Lord, let me touch your garment. I don't know these people. Yes, you. You're not sick, but you're praying for your friend, that man. You got a prayer card? No, you don't have one. You believe me to be God's prophet? You do? I wouldn't know that. Is that right? You believe that paralyzed condition will leave your friend? You believe the fellow will get well? You believe it? Raise up your hand and shake it to God, all right? May you receive just what you ask for. How about somebody over in this direction? You believe? All your heart? Somebody over there is suffering. Don't have a prayer card. Raise up your hand. Just say, I believe. What about it, mister? Do you believe? Believe me to be God's prophet? You got a hernia, a rupture. Do you believe that God will heal you? You're not from here either, are you? Toledo. That's right. I don't know you. Is that right? Raise up your hand. If that's, your, that's truth, all that's truth. All right. If you believe, go home and get well. I challenge you. In the name of Jesus, to believe the king is here. This little lady sitting out here on the inn, praying. She's not praying for herself. She's praying for her mother sitting back from her there. That's right. Bleeding ulcers. Been in the hospital. (laughs) Already have faith now and God will make you well. Amen. You believe with all your heart? Have it. Amen, sister. Go home now and be well. See, that's what it takes somebody to pray. What was that then? What did he say that was? Ulcers? That's a cancer demon, Pastor. Now, just a moment. Somebody's praying. Oh. 
Jesus, every one of you. 